Good morning. A couple of announcements real quick. Since I have you here, a uh, bit of a last call if you're interested in volunteering at the Northern Illinois Food Bank. They invite churches to do that in the month of September. And we're always welcome, of course, but they make a, a special special effort for it. So we'll have a group up there on Saturday. If you're interested in that, there's been details in the previous emails. Go ahead and respond to one of them and let us know. Uh, and this is a bit of a last call because they do like to have about a week's notice how many they can expect, though they'll always take more help, <laughs> virtually always. Uh, second thing, apologies that you haven't received a newsletter for September. There's no particularly pervasive uh, reason for that, but I will tell you the plan is to, instead of having like a, a late September newsletter and then an on-time October newsletter, how close those would be together, we're just going to do them together. So it'll be late into September, and it'll be September, October, fall, super edition, but in light of circumstances, it won't be much bigger than a traditional newsletter. And on the schedule, I hope for that is you can look for that this coming week. And that's in light of what I'm about to tell you next, which is that I intend to take two Sundays vacation in the week around them uh, in the near future here, including this coming Sunday, and then again the first Sunday in October. And this will only be the oh fourth and fifth Sundays that I've tried to actually take off since we started doing the online stuff a year and a half ago. So, uh, of course, they've sprinkled in some other things, supply preaching sermons put together by, say, synod staff uh, or what have you. Uh, and then last time, I, as, a, as sort of a fun little idea, I went back and preached a sermon that I had written nine years earlier. Uh, and <laughs> honestly, I had to tweak it a fair bit. It was not as good as I am today at this particular <laughs> task. So here's the plan with a little bit of an explanation. Feedback is welcome. In person, not much will change. Stay the course. The, this coming Sunday, Pastor Steve, who's a member here, will be uh, preaching and presiding. First Sunday in October, Pastor Carol, who's a retired pastor, lives between Oregon and Polo, so she's very local, has served many calls and interims in our area over the years. Uh, we'll be here that Sunday to preach and preside. But then online, I'm going to test pilot this idea. I'm sure I wasn't the first to have it, but I was the first to suggest it in our immediate group and push for it here, which is, I'm calling it virtual supply. See, among the retired or otherwise available Sunday morning pastors, there aren't very many in our area who are also uh, in the habit of recording sermons ahead of time. I won't say they can't do it. You know, if they had the equipment, if they really needed to, that sort of thing. I'm sure they could handle that, but it is a bigger ask for somebody who hasn't been doing that. Like, you, you don't, instead of being ready Friday or Saturday to preach one service on Sunday, I also want you to come in the, have it written the Monday before and come in on Tuesday so we can get it uploaded or at least ready to be uploaded before I physically leave. You know, it's a, it kind of doubles the ask just about. So at the same time, many congregations, as is appropriate for them, have moved to other ways of getting their online services together. Some do video chats, some do uh, live streams, some do, they record the service and upload it as quickly as they can afterward. And that's great, that's appropriate for them. It's not real particular, particularly appropriate for us. We don't have stable enough internet for the live stuff to be reliable don't like the idea of folks who aren't comfortable coming that Sunday being asked to just wait till Sunday afternoon. That feels odd. I uh, just don't like it, if I'm being honest. And then the, all, the whole service being online either way adds this layer of tedium with copyrights and costs, for that matter, that, and equipment. I mean, the equipment we're using here just simply would not work well for that. So... In other words, it's not appropriate for us, and it, for a few other congregations in the area, it's likewise not appropriate for them. So I've introduced this idea, and I hope to get a few people involved of virtual supply. So what this looks like is I ask the pastor at a nearby congregation, I say, I'm going to be gone this Sunday. Would you mind recording a day earlier than you normally would, a day or two as appropriate, and get that to me 
and then I'll just simply plop it into one of our online services. You provide the sermon. It doesn't take much for me to do the other stuff. Um, and we'll be off to the races, and then I'll return the favor. So this doesn't cost anything. It just, the pastors of these congregations could just agree to return the favor as appropriate. So this coming Sunday in the video, I plan to have Pastor Scott from Faith in Forreston, and then uh, two Sundays later, Pastor Julie from the Methodist Church in Mount Morris, and then, like I said, hopefully get a few more on the list. And then when their congregations need it, when those pastors take a, a Sunday off and their supply preacher doesn't want to or isn't able to, whatever the case may be, add, uh, con prepare their sermon to contribute to the online video, they can ask me, and I'll do it for them that week. And we'll just keep in mind, like, this is a sermon that'll go to multiple settings, what have you, just try to make it appropriate for the, for the week. So that's uh, the plan, and I want you to let me know if it works well or doesn't work well, since this is the online crew, you will be most affected by this idea. Uh, and then just to, to note, because I said I will just drop it in, if, if I were to, and I shouldn't say I, if any preacher were to say, I'm going to take this Sunday off, but I'm going to write, rehearse, like practice, perform, perform, preach a sermon, to the camera so I can have the online video still just be me and be new and a new sermon and yada yada. Uh, that's not much of a vacation. That's more like, well, I plan to sleep in on Sunday, but I'm going to do absolutely everything else. Um, so this is to, you know, actually give each other some time off without increasing any costs or cumbersome anything to the congregations. So that's the plan. We'll see how it works. This was enough announcements. I didn't do any for the last couple of weeks, so make enough for lost time. Um, all right, let's get started. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God whose teaching is life, whose presence is sure, and whose love is endless. Amen. Let us confess our sins to the one who welcomes us with an open heart. God, our comforter, like lost sheep we have gone astray. We gaze upon abundance and see scarcity. We turn our faces away from injustice and oppression. We exploit the earth with our apathy and greed. Free us from our sin, gracious God. Listen when we call out to you for help. Lead us by your love to love our neighbors as ourselves. Amen. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. By the gift of grace in Christ Jesus, God makes you righteous. Receive with glad hearts the forgiveness of all your sins. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O oh God, through suffering and rejection, you bring forth our salvation. And by the glory of the cross, you transform our lives. Grant that for the sake of the gospel, we may turn from the lure of evil, take up our cross, and follow your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our first reading comes from the third chapter of James, where James writes, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness, for all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is perfect, able to keep the whole body in check with a bridle. If we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Or look at ships. Though they are so large that it takes strong winds to drive them, yet they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. 
How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire, and the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among our members as a world of iniquity. It stains the whole body, sets on fire the cycle of nature, and itself set on fire by hell. For every species of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species, but no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this ought not be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives or a grapevine figs? No more can salt water yield fresh. Here ends the reading. The Holy Gospel, according to St. Mark, the eighth chapter. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others Elijah, and still others one of the prophets. He asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered Jesus, You are the Messiah. And Jesus sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan! For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed 
when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Grace and peace to you, sisters and brothers in Christ. And speaking of Christ, who do you say Jesus is? We've got a famous exchange to start us off here from Mark, and it's probably famous, or at least a famous line, because it's yet another time that Jesus uses language that would startle maybe even rattle the uninitiated. Get behind me, Satan. Now that's not surprising language if you know what's at stake. Peter is chief among the disciples. He's soon to be a major leader in the early church. It's a big deal that he'd undermine Jesus's mission. It puts him in line with Satan himself if he were to try to stop Jesus from going through with what Jesus says must be done simply because he doesn't understand. But we don't start with that famous line. We don't end there either. There's build up and follow up around this in this conversation. And it began, it starts with Jesus curiously asking, what are the people out there saying about who Jesus is? And like we might expect, given all the amazing things Jesus has done and yet asked people to keep it quiet, getting those rumors going, the rumors are in the ballpark and yet still quite incorrect. Basically, the people out there seem to think that Jesus is one and the same as some other major figure now back from the dead. He's doing the same sort of preaching, repent, the kingdom is drawn near, as John the Baptist. So that's a candidate. He's doing the same sort of miracles that Elijah did, so maybe Elijah, and he's preaching an interpretation of the law that fits very well, echoes certain prophets like Isaiah. But what about those who know him best? What about those who have seen the most, who get the explanations? What did the disciples say? And Peter gets it in one, you know. We, we haven't come to expect that from the disciples, but he's at least on the right path. Peter answers, the Messiah. It's the right answer, but as we see by his example, he doesn't quite understand what that word means. And this is going to be an ongoing theme. The people out there don't know what Messiah means, and the people out there today don't know what Messiah means. So Jesus goes to explain it a bit. He leads with again telling them, keep it a secret. But then he brings in this title, Son of Man, and tells them what the Son of Man must do. Remember, the Jewish people, many, maybe most, anticipated a Messiah. But it wasn't just one idea of what that would look like. There were many ideas. Some thought the Messiah would be more like Moses or more like David or a supernatural angelic sort. And that's where the Son of Man expression got used. At least one of the things it could mean was to describe a powerful, maybe all-powerful supernatural force coming from the clouds with an army of angels. And Jesus refers to that exact idea, right? Coming in the clouds, coming with angels. But he reframes the expression and sounds, again, an awful lot like Isaiah. Isaiah is the one that taught us that the Messiah will suffer, and though innocent, will suffer for the sake of the guilty. Now, it would be nice if that was the whole thing, right? The Messiah suffers for the guilty and then comes back in the clouds. A nice, tidy little definition we could fit into the dictionary. That would, uh, it would fit well with our culture to have a nice, tidy answer. But we don't quite get that. Instead, what we get comes bit by bit, piece by piece, a bit of a mystery that Jesus will encapsulate much of those different theories about the Messiah and just the same, subvert just as many expectations. As far as the story of Mark goes, this is Jesus checking in to see where the crowds are at with all this, where the disciples are at, because the timing of the ministry and the crucifixion will depend in part on how ready the people are. What they know, what they understand about Jesus, that's important, sure, but also, what will they say? Because you can imagine an alternative without the messianic secret. What if Jesus just dove into the deep end, went in headlong, and got himself crucified right away, such that even Peter had no clue that he was even the Messiah, much less what does Messiah mean, and then just figured maybe Jesus was another prophet among many? That wouldn't have worked, <laughs> at least not nearly so well. What Peter had to say about Jesus would turn out to matter an awful lot. His words would impact the whole world. And context is so important. It's just about everything. And in Peter's context, 
what he would say about Jesus would impact the entire world. Not just his words. Of course, we got to remember a few others. There's the other disciples and apostles besides. You got James, you got Paul. Maybe two dozen witnesses or so, with the help of the Holy Spirit, would preach about Jesus in a way that got the church growing faster than any other religious institution ever had or would, in spite of the fact that it was both alien and illegal. That's the timing Jesus is getting just right here. It spread like wildfire because of what people said when Jesus did what Jesus did. And of course, that fits one-to-one with how James instructed his church in his context on how they ought to consider their speech, their words. Remember once again that at this time of the church year, we reflect on how Christians are called to live in light of the gospel, to take these lessons from Jesus and others and apply them to our lives in our context. So James leans heavily on this idea that his church needs to do something with their faith and gives them a lot to reflect on in their own lives. Today, that lesson is a two-part story hinged around the tongue. On the first, consider where in the world we see small objects or, or forces, small ideas, directing much larger ones, bridles, rudders, and so on. The tongue is a lot like that, being such a small member among many in our bodies, and yet it directs and drives human lives and the world more than the rest combined. On the second, consider where you see conflict, contradictory ideas springing forth from the same source. Can you get salt water and fresh water from the same river? Does a fruit tree bear several types of fruit? No. Instead, when nature seems to be in order and to be effective at what it was created to do and fulfilling its purpose, we see this separation of categories. It's not both brackish and fresh water. At least in what is produced, we see a separation of categories. So these two metaphorical comparisons between the words we speak and how creation works should give us pause. They're worth taking a moment to reflect on, to figure on what is James telling his church they ought to do? What are we ought to do? And as it always goes with considering what's good or right in our actions, we should consider, could consider the extremes. And in the extremes, talking about how we use our words, you could think of the worst thing, a tyrannical leader motivating the masses to commit atrocities. Just the same, you can think of a compassionate king calling their people to work together for the good of all. And in both cases, with a charismatic enough figure, with powerful enough words, with a large enough platform, enough people to listen, the world around them can be reshaped. Perhaps the entire world can be changed. But that's the extremes, and they aren't the only ones. In smaller ways, this applies to everyone. We can speak well or ill of each other. We can speak well or ill of those leaders. We can encourage each other to be selfless or selfish, to, be, to give life or to risk it. Your words have power. They can bring people together or drive them apart. So, reflecting on our context and what our words can do. Today, for some time now, we've entered a set of circumstances, a phase in this pandemic in which your words and your actions and example have moved well past metaphor and can directly contribute to whether people live or die. That's not political. It's not, it's not hyperbolic. Americans are dying by the thousands because they and those around them fell for bad information and were tricked into living irresponsibly because of the words that were spoken to them. This is a stark and unfortunate reality that we're faced with today. But even before this was the case and even after this is over, it will still be true that our words can bring life or bring death preserving life and promoting the quality of life and caring for those who are most vulnerable, outcast, and forgotten. These are the calls of the church. And our words as Christians and as congregations matter. They have power. They also come with a little, an asterisk, a little footnote besides. 
When people know that you are a Christian, because they know you're up at this church every Sunday, or because you have shared what Jesus means to you directly, or you've just identified yourself publicly, right? You got a cross around your neck. You got one of those little fish on the bumper of your car. Your words bear all the weight and power that anyone else's do, all else being equal, but they also answer another question, the question Jesus asked Peter, and the world is perpetually asking you. Who do you say Jesus is? Case in point, don't flick anyone off while driving your car if you've got one of those ichthys, the little Jesus fish, on the back. <laughs> because you represent Christ in the world to those who know you at all. And you express your faith in your words and in your actions, and you say who Jesus is. If your words express hatred for outsiders or apathy towards suffering or indifference toward injustice, indifference towards death, the death of innocent people, deaths caused by misinformation or people struck by bad luck or who happen to be born into a harsh part of the world, if that's what comes with your words, what does that tell the world about what Jesus means to you? And by implication and extension, what Jesus means to us. Who do we say Jesus is? The Messiah. Sure. But like Peter, we don't always understand quite what that means. And like the world before Jesus was there, that's how it is in our world today. Most people have no idea what it means when we say Jesus is the Messiah. So maybe we flesh it out a bit. We say Jesus is my Savior, our Savior, the Savior of the world, the Redeemer, the Deliverer, the greatest teacher, prophet, rabbi, sacrifice, and victor in all of human history, in all of the cosmos besides. We can say all of that. But in a world in which more and more people don't have a clue what we mean when we say Messiah or any other theologically charged term seeped in our tradition to describe what God has done in Christ, how we talk about it when we're at church. If they don't know what those churchy words mean, the only words they have to go by, the only words they even hear, are the ordinary day-to-day -day sort of vocabulary that we use on the streets, the kind of language we wouldn't necessarily use at church. Now, if our lives and our words in the day-to-day out there in the world, do not match those theologically charged confessions of faith, then we've created a separation. We've created a distance between what the world sees and what we say about Jesus. Rather, what we know to be true about Jesus is no longer what we say about Jesus. And if that separation exists and is in conflict, then the world will never learn. They'll never even care to learn what does Messiah mean. Now, I wish there was an easy solution for that, a sort of 10-second takeaway that we could take home, take to the bank, get this mess sorted out. That would be better than simply, well, try harder, right? Work on the words you use, do better about promoting life. At the same time, it feels like we're left in the same tension that James left his audience in, at least for the moment here. I'm sure the letter goes on. We'll keep reading it. We'll keep reading the... The gospel, besides, will reflect in and out, week in and week out. There will be more to these stories, but at least for the moment, these verses ought to leave our stomach just in knots to consider the reality that we're faced with. When James compares our wildfire starting tongues, the power of our words to well-ordered creation, our tongues don't work like well-ordered creation fulfilling their purpose. It's not like a river that is either fresh or salty. He points out that we proclaim Christ with the same tongue that we use to curse those made in God's likeness, the people Jesus died for, any of God's beloved, any fellow human being. Our tongues simply don't work like well-ordered creation. And it's not even like we have some that are good, right? some that speak well and some that don't. It's each of us. Each of us are in that circumstance. Our lives 
in our words both spring forth life and spew forth death. Today we're left with all James had to say about that tension. We're called to live through that tension, and the way he phrases it is probably about as good as it gets. It ought not be this way. It should not be the case that our words that can proclaim Christ and bring life instead sometimes bring curses and bring death. It should not be this way. Amen. With that, I invite you to confess the faith of the church using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. 
May children and heirs of God's promise, we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Revealing God, you have made yourself known through bread and wine, water and word. Continue to nurture your church, that it is a place where your presence is experienced and shared. Lord, in your mercy. Creating God, you brought life into being and called it good. Bring new creation to lands devastated by tornadoes, hurricanes, floods, fires, and other disasters. Restore forests and curb overflowing waters. Lord, in your mercy. Protecting God, you desire all people to live in safety and peace. Provide for all who are in danger. Strengthen first responders to help meet the complex needs of others. Provide care and compassion as they face trauma themselves. And be with those who may be in harm's way today. We pray for John, Josh, Tyler, Morgan, Jack, Robert, Matt, Nick, and Dane. Lord, in your mercy. Transforming God, you announce release to the captives and freedom to the oppressed. Break chains of discrimination and injustice. Amplify voices that go unheard and inspire us to advocate for those who are overlooked. Lord, in your mercy. Forming God, you gather this community together. Shape our communal life that in our prayer, praise, and worship, we honor you and encourage one another. Keep our disagreements civil and increase our joy in working together. And be with those in our hearts and in our minds, those in our community, immediate and uh, and extended. We pray for Jerry, Joe, Jim, Renee's aunt, Charlene, Gail, Lisa, Chloe, Connie, Larry, Cindy, John, and Melody. Grace, Danny, Doug, Bailey, Connie, Kendall, Jean, Horst, Barbara, Richard, Serenata, Anne, Carol, Leona, Amy, Dean, Andrea, Mabel, Crystal, Alan, Bob, Ivan, Aaron, Dave, and Marge. Lord, in your mercy. Redeeming God, you accompany your people through every stage of life. We give you thanks for the saints who now rest in your embrace. We give you thanks especially for Edie at her recent passing. Comfort those who mourn and give them strength to face the days ahead. Lord, in your mercy. Receive these prayers, O God, and those in our hearts known only to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. <laughs> As you take a moment to share a greeting of peace, I'll remind you that our offerings come in through several venues. And as we pray together here, we're giving thanks for those gifts given and received, however they were given and received. So with that, let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. Through your goodness, you have blessed us with these gifts, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Use us and what we have gathered in feeding the world with your love through the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. People of God, you are Christ's body, bringing new life to a suffering world. The Holy Trinity, one God, bless you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace. The living word dwells in you. Thanks be to God.